Um, yes, indeed, Mike. We've heard so much of the negative stuff coming from one side um, about the NHS, mm. and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd like to put a bit of a balance on it, if it's OK with yourself. Please, sir. please do, yes, go on. Back in 2004, I ended up with a, um, an infected gallbladder, which caused me to go to the hospital in the middle of the night right. uh, in extreme pain, and uh, I was actually still on a trolley, um, 14 hours later. Goodness me. Uh, well, having not been seen yet? Uh, having not been seen properly. And what got me seen was when the consultant at the time, the consultant surgeon who was assigned to me, um, uh, started really carrying on about uh, a bed manager system that they had at that time under, mm. the, Labor, under the Labor rule. And um, uh, he had to really get really fierce with them and, and, and get me admitted. Right. And in the end, I spent a week on the day uh, patient surgery ward. Um, was this at the Conquest, by any chance? This was at the Conquest when it was an almost new PFI hospital. OK, yeah. right. Yeah. And, um, and then I waited, and this is another bit, you know, this is how, under labour, <laughs> I waited nearly two years to have the operation that ensued from that. Goodness. Um, and they were closing wards at that time because they they uh, they couldn't manage the hospital and run things properly. Um, and if I'm taking a subjective but honest assessment of the hospital today and then, it's a million times better today. Yes. It, it really is. It's being run better um, and it's being run more sensibly. Yes. I, I, I use the word sensibly. I think I don't think there's any doubt, Derek, that the NHS has always had problems. I mean, all my life we've been in and out of hospitals with children and uh, my parents sometimes and either myself, uh, you know, people that we know, friends and all that. But, I mean, it's a magnificent uh, service, sort of almost despite itself, because it's so big and so unwieldy that it's very, yeah. very difficult, I would imagine, to manage in any way, shape or form. But I also know people that work inside the system who say yep. there's an awful lot of waste, there's an awful lot of overpayment of things, there's an awful lot of double purchasing of things that don't need to be paid for, and there's an awful lot of people using the service now more than there were 10 years ago. Well, I mean, I think if we've had, you know, I, I, this may be a politically incorrect thing to say, but if we've had 3 million people come into the country in 10 years, it's got to have had an effect on our hospitals and schools. Well, of course it has. Absolutely it has. And it, that, that's made it more difficult now to get uh, a GP in certain parts of the country. It's almost impossible to get on a GP's register. It's made it much more difficult for certain elective surgery to be done in a quick way. And people have had to wait for a long time. But I think it's unfortunate the way that, that, that political parties and individual politicians use it um, as a stick to beat everybody with and to completely claim always that, you know, despite the fact that the Tory party's been in charge of the NHS for more years than the Labour Party, that they're somehow trying to destroy it. Yeah, it's, it's a ridiculous uh, frame of mind. I have to say also, we've got um, fantastic GP services down here. Um, and in my practice, GP practice, you can get an appointment usually and every time you want one on the day. Right. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it is, as you say, a much more improved service than it, than it was many years ago. Derek, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, I just thought I'd um, mention that um, last winter I was very seriously ill okay. and at a leading central London um, zone one, in zone one, I won't say which, I don't think you want me to, um, at the hospital at A&E. Okay. I spent from about 8 p.m. until about midday the following day, so that's about 16 hours, right. waiting for them to try and find a bed. Oh, so were you, were you on a chair, were you in a waiting room? I was in the A&E in a chair, right. surrounded by other people who were also seriously ill, either sitting upright in a chair like me or on a trolley or something, that they um, were using. Um, and those of us who were seriously ill, we were having to wait for a bed to be found anywhere. Mm. And it took them about 16 hours wow. to find me a bed. And were they able to treat anything that, was, that you were suffering from in that, in that time? Uh, well, they were trying to treat, but if you can imagine when you're seriously ill, sitting upright in a chair yeah. without one minute's sleep, from 8 p.m. until midday the next day. I mean, um, 
that do, that's no good for you. That's no good for the staff or the working conditions. That's no good for the morale. It looked like a war zone. It felt like a war zone. I thought I was in a foreign country. Mm. And um, it was quite um, alarming, I distressing, yeah. demoralising. And so when I hear the Tories say that this is all myth or it's all exaggerated or it's all fake news... Uh, they're actually. Uh, I don't think the Tories have been saying that. I mean, they have well, been, I think Boris has said it's like some sort of Loch Ness monster story, and he, they use the word myth. I have heard them use the word myth. Well, that's that's when he's talking about it, the NHS being sold off to Trump. Uh, well, well, it, maybe you should interview Dr. Bob Gill, who spent more than seven years investigating and researching what has been happening to the NHS. And what does he say? Uh, well, just why don't you interview him? I mean, he's available. Is he? Well, do yeah, you know him? You, you can find him on Twitter, Dr Bob Gill, G I W L. Okay. Well, why can't you just tell me what he says? Well, he's he's made a two-hour documentary about it called The Great NHS Heist, and it's on YouTube, free to watch. OK. Well, the I mean, there's NHS lots of things, heist and, there's and lots of things that are said. That, I mean, there was, there was a doctor, a junior doctor, who was on Channel 4 News last night claiming that Boris Johnson was responsible for 5,000 people dying and that, he should, and that he, death, should, and yeah. he should be in prison. Yeah, there are increased number of deaths because of uh, 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 the gradual dismantling. So how did, how did your story end, Laura? Did you get admitted to a bed eventually? Uh, well, as I say, about 16 hours okay. later. OK, and were they able to help you? Well, that's why I was... They were waiting for a bed to help me, yes. Yes. But it took 16 hours... No, but I'm saying how, 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 long, well, how long were you then there for? What, in the ward? Well, in the hospital, yeah. Well, for about three days after, yeah. Okay. And, and I'm glad you're... Hopefully it hasn't recurred, the pneumonia. Um, well, um, I've had it a number of times, so okay. um, I'm vulnerable to mm. it. Um, but to... Um, I mean, y y you know, the worst possible thing for someone in that situation is um, to be... You know, 16 hours overnight, no sleep, in a chair. Oh, I know, it's uh, dreadful. Surrounded by others like that. And, and, and my experience of hospitals is that it used to be two hours, then it was four hours, now it's over four hours, yeah. and, and even 16 hours. Sure. You know? I, I think, listen, I think everybody knows that there are problems. I think everybody knows that it but depends there's a on... there's reason why it there's depends, problems. Well, there are many reasons why there are problems, Laura, as, yeah, as we've talked about. it's been deliberately done. That's why I'm suggesting well, I, I, that you... That is an opinion. That is, that's, that's your opinion, Laura. No, uh, it's not an opinion, it's fact. Well, it's Why not, don't actually. you interview Dr Bob Gill? Well, you've mentioned that to me a few times. I'll see whether he's worth interviewing. Thank you, Laura, very much indeed. Calling you about the, about the NHS and um, just to say, you know, you don't know why you can't get into A&E. Um, when I had a very serious car accident three years ago, I mm. had to be literally blue-lighted hospital, blah, 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 brain surgery. You know, brain surgeons are not one a penny. They actually had to cut a piece out of my skull right. there and then. You can't wait for that to be done and for someone to say, oh, I'm sorry, there are no beds. You know, that had to be done or I would have died. Yes. I was, you know, in nowhere for the blood to go. So, you know... World yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that you can't... So there's a lot of stuff that you yes. can't plan for, right? Indeed, you cannot plan for that. So if you are delayed, it may be because somebody is having brain surgery, which they weren't expecting to, when they just popped out that afternoon. Right. Well, I mean, in the case of, me. of, of the, the little boy up in Leeds, he was in a bed, uh, but they asked him to get out of the bed because somebody who needed the bed more had come into the hospital, into the paediatric unit, and so they were asked to go and sit in a waiting yeah. room. Now, it's not ideal... You know. It's not ideal, but there are question marks over that, actually. If you've, you've obviously read yes. all the reports on that, you've, you've read all that. So, I mean, there may, you don't know why that bed was needed, if indeed that was, that was the case. Right. And also, I mean, I've, I've had pneumonia. I didn't go into, into hospital for it. You know, you, you know it's, not, it's not something that will kill you. There's, no, there's, also, yeah, there's, there's, old. there's also no doubt at all, Jenny, that a lot of people go to A&E uh, who don't need to go to A&E. I, I, know, I, know, I know lots of nurses who are listening to this show even as we speak who always Precisely. say to me there are people coming in all the time to A&E who shouldn't be there. Exactly. You've got that exactly right. And so people just go into sort of somewhere to go. Yeah. But you, you do not... If somebody really, really needs it, as did I that night or I would have died, then, you know, that's a very different matter. When I went back for a, a follow-up, when they had um, a piece made in Switzerland uh, a year later... Uh, and Switzerland is not part of the EU, by the way. Mm. And, you know, you've still got people who trained in the States 
not in the EU. And, uh, you know, pieces made in Switzerland, world class, a world class brain surgeon operating on you. Mm. So if you, and the, on that time, when I went back, I had to go back a year later in order to have a skull piece put in, which they have made in Switzerland, um, you know, they couldn't do it straight away. They, they came and the, the surgeon said to me, the surgeon came himself, actually, while we were waiting. I've been there for hours and hours and hours. And so he said, I'm really, really sorry. I, I can't do you today because as a gentleman, if I don't do him, he is going to go blind. Yeah. Fine, you know, I'll go home. Of course. You have to, you know, and they can't just have loads, as you say, a lot of brain surgeons walking around waiting for something to do. That's Absolutely right. right. Jenny, thanks very much indeed for your call.